My name is Alexia Rebney. Um, I am a board member of COTAD and I am also the admissions coordinator and an instructor for the occupational therapy program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I identify with the pronouns she, her, and hers. And tonight I would like to begin by thanking um, the many of my COTAD co-board members and executive board members who have worked vol voluntarily worked to make this night possible. So um, I also wanted to recognize Dr. Stephanie Lancaster behind the scenes here running our Zoom, um, Devlin New and Michelle De Jesus who are um, on our media pages right now. So thanks to all of those who have really worked together to make tonight possible. I also wanted to share that we are planning to record portions of the event tonight. So please refrain from using um, identifiable information about yourself or others. And so moving into the next slide, Stephanie. We also wanted to begin tonight by giving a sincere thanks to our supporters and donors. So we here in COTED are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So thank you to those who have donated this evening and those who have donated previously to make events such as this and our future initiatives possible. Have it, Steph? So you can see we have a really exciting and packed agenda tonight. Um, we will begin with our welcomes and then we will move into our panelists introductions, which I'm really excited about. Our panelists will respond to three questions and then we will have an open question and answer session. We will then all break for small group discussions. We'll return for a large group discussion and then we'll have our closing. Next slide, please, Stephanie. And I think we're going to move on to one more. Dr. Arame Anvarzade will be here. Um, she is just uh, experiencing some technical difficulties right now. So first, to get us started in our welcome tonight, we are going to have our COTAD founding and current director, Dr. Dr. Catherine Hoyt, provide us with an introduction to COTAD. Thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody's doing well and staying healthy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evenings. I'm sure for people who are involved in education or who are students are having a busy start to their semesters. So we really appreciate you taking the time to join us for this important um, So we have expectations that students will practice cultural competence as they um, analyze those case studies. Um, and then we expect for our students to demonstrate um, competence in terms of a valid assessment and screening process. So again, we look for um, that um, perception and that care um, when they, as they design assessments and screening. We, offer, we also offer a Spanish language class in our program for providers and interveners because Spanish language is really huge in California, Southern California, and, and, and embedded in that class we have expectations around cultural competence as well. Um, and then I guess the third layer to this is that we are currently reorganizing our curriculum and um, we're paying attention and looking to have a stronger health and occupational justice thread um, that kind of flows through all of our coursework. Um, and that's kind of uh, how we're currently managing. Everything seems to be, we seem to be in a phase of talking everything over and considering new ideas and um, we're hoping that the occupational justice and occupation and health justice thread will really help us be responsive to any changes. So we had tried at Quinnipiac and most of you probably know um, at Quinnipiac we are 98% um, Caucasian and, um, and when we came on board with um, doing the new doctoral program, this is our first um, cohort, there was really a strong feeling from the entire faculty and from the director that they really wanted to sort of change that mode um, overall. So from the beginning, when we first brought the students to do their interviews, we talked a lot about social justice and we talked a lot about do you know what social determinants of health are? You know, all of that. Because we know we're going to give them a generalist sort of OT thing, right? They're going to get all those things that we know for our wonderful field. But it's this sort of second thing of being um, really interested in paying attention to populations and the bigger, broader piece. 
And I think for some students, they may not have wanted that and they sort of chose not to do that. Um, and then there was people that it really, really excited them. And I think by, you know, especially starting new, um, having people focus on that as part of our profession and sort of saying it up front that this is part of what it means to be an OT and your occupational identity, um, I think it, it gets people in the mindset um, of that. And we really made a concerted effort to really talk about even in some of the, uh, you know, the Blackboard sites and all of that about inclusion, because, you know, we're seeing this as an issue in general, right? Um, so they don't even include each other in some things, right? You can see kids being um, ostracized even in the classrooms. So one of the things that's really an important piece is sort of this, who are you, right? And I think Arame really talked about this in terms of intersectionality, right? Who are you? And what, how does it help to talk about all the multiple aspects of who you really are as a person? And so no matter where you come from, you can talk about all these wonderful different things as part of the introduction. And I think it puts everybody on sort of an, an even playing field, right? Because like, oh, I didn't know that about you. I didn't realize that that's what you did. Um, and I think that really uh, does help. The cultural, the cultural reflection and really getting that awareness, I think that has to happen right away. Um, and it has been pretty good. I'm not saying it's perfect, believe me. It was very some tense discussions, right? Just talking about these things with all these diverse people. Um, but I think everybody understands where we're coming from and what we're hoping to do in terms of transforming the profession and moving it forward. So I really, I really think, you know, like Natasha is saying and Clarissa is saying that, you know, starting from the beginning, talking about it, I think just gets everybody on that foundation a little bit. So that's been kind of, that's been helpful. Absolutely. Does anyone else from the panel have anything they'd like to add or share again? Or are we ready to move on to our next question? Again, we're gonna work to, um, respond to some of the question, the chats, the, the questions coming up in the chat, but we're going to have that open Q&A after these three panelists questions. Okay, moving on to question two. What are some strategies that students of color are utilizing to manage instances of racism and discrimination during field work? Hey, this is Lauren. Um, I can start for this question. Um, so my background, obviously, from the introductions is different than our other panelists, um, not specifically in education, but working as a clinician primarily, and by that I mean in a workplace setting 40 hours a week, not um, as an educator or program director or academic field work coordinator. Um, I work at a university hospital, and so we see quite a few students coming through all the time in our office. There's students in our rehab department um, taking students. It has slowed down with COVID, but we're picking back up. Um, and so I've had the experience of seeing some strategies that students of color use, as well as reading um, various articles and things about the perspectives. And it seems like students tend to use either what might be described as maladaptive strategies as an overarching label. I'm careful with that word because in labeling them as maladaptive, it's dismissing the fact that some of these things are protecting these students. And so it might be easy to label it as maladaptive, which I'll talk about a few of those, but it's also something that students are doing to protect their, their sense of self, their identities, their sometimes even their ability to participate and continue in the program and graduate. Um, so for example, um, sorry about that, some students uh, flee. Um, so there's a piece written by an occupational therapist named Fatima Adamu, and she discusses the impact of being pulled aside by her white manager just a few days into her um, basically new role as a hand therapist. And he told her that she was, quote, overly confident and needed to humble herself. Um, and then a few days later, so that kind of took her aback. And so she kind of felt for the next week or so that she had to water herself down. Um, and then she learned that 
this person was debating with other leadership there whether he should comment and let her know that her hair quote might be too big of a statement for someone new to be making. Um, and so in that person's experience, they wrote, um, despite my passion and eagerness to succeed, I had encountered an atmosphere that was too toxic to foster significant professional growth without sacrificing my mental health. Um, you can read the piece in its entirety. It's on the OT for Actions blog, and I really recommend that. It's a really insightful read um, for students, anyone who's involved in this profession. But that person's strategy was to flee. They recognize this isn't somewhere that I'm going to be able to grow. This isn't somewhere with people who understand who I am or who are interested in understanding where I am. And some students choose to end a field work early or to leave their field work. Um, other students survive by using a strategy of silence and suppression. So I hear these things and being told this either implicitly or explicitly, but I keep my head down, I come, I do what I have to do for eight hours a day and I go home and they're keeping those things to themselves. Other people use self-censorship, might also be known as code switching, which again can be an adaptive strategy, but some people feel such that the power dynamic isn't that they can't be themselves. And so they change the way that they present themselves with colleagues or even clients to better fit in what they feel is going to make them successful in that field work. Um, so again, just some of the strategies that might be perceived as maladaptive in the sense that it's taking a mental toll on those students, even sometimes to the point that they aren't able to complete um, the field work. Um, and some other, on the flip side of that, some adaptive strategies, um, and certainly let it be known that students often use a combination depending on the specific situation, but other students have sought mentorship. Um, for example, I have a mentee who's in the minority mentorship program and she was sharing with me some of her experiences about being the only student of color who was there in an area in rural Texas, not feeling as if she was able to speak up. And so I was able to help be a support for her and say, you aren't alone. This is something that many people experience being told, you know, you're too bold or the way that you talk to people is this, that, and the third. And so in a place where she was second guessing herself and really feeling like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. It sounds like every time I open my mouth, you know, I'm saying the wrong thing. And so I encouraged her to open a dialogue with her field work coordinator and say, I've gotten this feedback before, but it feels more of like, this is a cultural issue versus, you know, the patients aren't shying away from me. I haven't gotten that feedback, you know, from other people. It just seems strange. Um, people also seek emotional and psychological support from friends, family members, um, certainly program faculty if they're comfortable. And some people, depending on um, their own level of comfort or experience, might be called to do some self-advocacy and say, hey, what you're saying is racist. What you're doing is making it difficult for me to be here. I don't feel comfortable. This is not a safe space for me. I need there to be a change, um, whether that's with fieldwork coordinator or directly with someone who's in their program, a faculty member, or liaison. Um, so wide variety of strategies that I've seen and experienced. Thank you for sharing, Lauren. Um, I think you've touched on many things that I've experienced as a student, um, for sure. And, you know, I, I didn't, for many years, I didn't feel safe to discuss those issues, especially when I made that leap from student, then to clinician, and now to the academy. Um, and I think that was sort of a, a driving force for me when I entered the academy to be that advocate and to start creating safe spaces for students and opening that dialogue because I felt so isolated. And I used a number of the things that you described when I was a student in that situation. You know, I remember having a day where I thought, am I even meant to be an occupational therapist? Could I possibly be this terrible of a human being? This person makes me feel really awful. It was my second level two, and I thought, I don't even know if I want to be in this profession. I've just encountered this with classmates. I've encountered this with faculty. Now in field work, I'm just done. And so I, I think as I entered the academy, I, I took a deep reflection and thought, you know, I never want anyone else to have that experience. So how do I address this? You know, one was creating the um, minority mentorship program. 
So that was one piece of it. It was part of the healing process there. And then leaning on other people. And I even, I reached out to faculty of color at other schools and I got a wide range of responses on how to handle this. You know, there were people who said, put your head down, get the job done. Do not say anything, just do it. And I had other faculty who kept saying, you know, I think you should advocate, but I just didn't feel safe as one of the only people of color in my program, not a very inclusive program. I, I didn't think it was safe for me. And then as I, as my career kind of progressed, I thought, well, you know, I need to start doing a little bit more. And that's when I started trying to recruit other colleagues to be more involved and saying, you know, this is a real issue. How do we do it? So the last university that I was at, they started a COTAD chapter and, you know, they started having that dialogue. So even though I wasn't directly involved, somehow, um, I, I am and I advocate for people to use all the resources, but it's really hard. It, it's a tough conversation to have. And I, I sometimes have to check myself because I, I can go above and beyond for certain students, but I remember being that student. And so looking at it from a boundary standpoint, you know, not to be accused of favoritism with students, but I do feel a little bit more protective of a certain group of students because I have that lived experience. So safe spaces, you know, mentors, caring people. And, you know, I'm so thankful there are a couple of people on the call tonight that um, reminded me of my worth and my value. And that I was meant to be an occupational therapist. Two of my mentors are on the call tonight. And I just want to thank you for keeping me in the game and <laughs> helping me realize that um, I had something to contribute to the profession. So thank you. And special shout out to Cheryl Lucas tonight for <laughs> all the help and support over the years. It was easy. It was easy, really. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion around how do you, do we, are we specific enough with students of color around um, hitting these issues head on, right? Um, do, we, do we need to say, you may encounter this on field work and let's try to help you to figure out what your game plan is if in fact that does happen. Um, and I think that's real, that's a very difficult conversation to have and it's a very, um, you know, as a white person with a lot of privilege, it, I mean, I'm, I, I don't even know if you, I feel terrible. I feel awful that I even have to have this discussion on the same token. It's real. And we care about our students and we want them to not get blindsided by some of this. And, um, and I do think as faculty and as academic fieldwork coordinators, it is our responsibility um, to be able to do that transition for students. And I, I do think, you know, uh, Lauren and I, we've worked together before and it's just so great to see you, um, you know, about why wouldn't, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about when you're talking about who you are, you know, um, were mentioning, you didn't mention that people go back to their fieldwork coordinator, right? Are they comfortable coming back to us with that issue too? Or what is, what's happening with that? You know, cause you'd think that you would be able to get, at least have a little support from that as well, you know, but I think that they don't, you know, people may not want to, I've heard this from students. I don't want to act like there's a problem, right? I want to try to figure it out myself. And in the meantime, they're suffering as you described, Lauren. Um, so what do we do? You know, how do we face this and not pretend that it's not there, right? And say, listen, this might happen. So let's work on it and you know what your plan is. Um, I don't know what people think about that. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Cheryl and Natasha, that it's important to kind of, um, reset the expectations regarding definitions of harm and making that known 
students. And I think when you start to reset that expectations, then students feel more comfortable coming to you. Um, and then we're hearing from our students that they need the conversation to be initiated by our school, our department, and specifically by the field work team. And so we're working hard to let the students know that, you know, we need to talk about what you consider to be harm, no matter what your identity is. Um, and, and then we want to hear about those experiences of harm. Um, but it has to come from us. We, we have to, the students said that they need us to say that directly to them in order for them to understand that it's safe to come to us. Yeah. And some students are actually, are coming to the field work coordinators after, we've, after we're, we're trying to get this message out. But it takes a while, I think, to change people's understanding of that experience, you know? Because when I was a student, you just put your head down and you just got through it. But that's no longer, it, it wasn't acceptable then, and it's not <laughs> acceptable now. Um, but it takes a while to, to shift everyone's mindset to that question of, you know, harm is not acceptable. Um, and therefore, we have an obligation to let our students know that an obligation to support them in addressing that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, panelists. Does anyone have anything else to add for question two? Okay. And I'm seeing a lot of fantastic things coming in in the chat. And um, our next question here will um, fulfill some of those questions. So question three, next slide please, Stephanie. What resources are available for fieldwork educators to provide optimal fieldwork experiences for students of color? So just to continue with the line of discussion that we had before and under question number two, we've been really looking closely at question number three, you know, kind of how do we establish some firm ground to stand on to address this question of support for students. One of the things that we've done is to provide information to all of our fieldwork educators. Uh, around expectations of harm. And we've also provided them with written resource in the form of a document that talks about how to handle difficult conversations. Um, and then we put together a seminar around this topic with our fieldwork educators on, you know, the current environment, the current racialized environment, what the students might be experiencing, and then what their response could be to that. And we also offered them support from the fieldwork team. Um, it was important that we establish open safe spaces for the students and to establish closed safe spaces for the students and to educate everyone on what it means to have a safe space. That was a really important piece of all of this. Um, and then our division decided to broaden the participation in our diversity, access and, and equity committee so that we would have um, more people across different roles in the division, in the, in the department, uh, as a part of this conversation and hoping that people weren't working on this issue in silos. Um, so, which then supports the fieldwork team if we know kind of what's going on in the classrooms, what's going on in other spaces. Um, and then, but it's, so our challenge is to find ways to establish direct communication with the students that then allows us to support them better. And that I think is our biggest challenge. Um, how we begin the conversation and keep it going. Um, so we're trying to find, provide support that is going to be more systemic and, um, and more long lasting 
and then providing the safe space and then changing kind of the expectations around definitions of harm. I think I could, you know, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Clarissa, around the, um, you know, the touch points kind of thing too, right? Like how often should we reach out to, we don't, right? We don't really reach out to students when they're in field work unless there's an issue usually, mm -hmm. right? Um, is, there, is there a model or is there a way that, you know, we want to do these touch points with students, right? And just sort of say, how's things going, you know, and, and be able to kind of look at that. Um, because they may not, you know, as you say, reach out necessarily, you know, it's sort of like, I'm just keeping my head down. I want to just get through it. Um, the second piece that I think, uh, when we're thinking about this is how do we, um, help them to potentially pick the site where they might feel comfortable. We don't always have, um, opportunities for students to go and meet their field work person and see what the site's like and all of that. I mean, I know these are ideals, um, mm -hmm. but maybe for some people, um, it, it, it would be helpful, you know, to really mm -hmm. be sure that it's a good fit and that they feel, everybody feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, right. So Cheryl, just before I forget speaking to that point, you know, one of the things that I've been toying around with is coming up with a directory for you know, fieldwork educators who come from underrepresented backgrounds and um, trying to figure out how to do that. I know when I was a student, I wanted to have a fieldwork educator of color and it was, it was hard to find one in rural Ohio, <laughs> you know, and so I was going about asking like, who do you know? Or I asked other students about their fieldwork educator experiences, but sometimes it's, it's a little bit uncomfortable you know, to have that dialogue or find people who, who want to identify with a specific group and say, you know, yes, I'm, I'm a gay Indian woman and I want to take a student in, in this region. But that is something that I, I really wanted to explore is coming up with this, um, this directory of sorts. So I, I've been thinking about that, you know, moved on from mentoring. Maybe that's my next gig, right? Yeah. Coming up with this directory. Yeah, to Dr. Smet's point, um, I didn't speak for question one, but that was one of the, of the question of how are academic programs preparing students to provide optimal care is by having interactions with people who are from different backgrounds than they are. And so yes. making an active effort to recruit fieldwork educators who are members of the LGBT community, who are from diverse religious or spiritual backgrounds, who are from maybe even different parts of the country, right? People who are ethnically or culturally different, right? Whether they're an older student, if they're, you know, a student who just whatever these people are and they bring to the program, I think that's one of the ways that it's kind of built in. It's not something extra, but it's recruiting people so that everyone will have a fieldwork coordinator who's maybe, you know, African American or somebody who is Muslim or somebody who's a member of the LGBT community or has a different faith practice. And so that kind of learning edge or growing edges, you find out, oh, what assumptions did I have when they told me that I saw the name of my fieldwork coordinator and I, what did I think, you know, even just to report on that coming back from their first fieldwork. Um, so obviously I'm black and my name being Lauren Jones, I've had people meet me and this hasn't happened necessarily in the workplace, but other places I've been places of business, people have said, oh, you're not, you're not what I thought you would look like. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm sitting there like, okay, well, that's a really, and then you ask them what they thought I would look like. And then all of a sudden they don't know, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. right. But so having these kind of in situ learning experiences of, so when you read this email, what did you think? Or when you saw that they were treating somebody, were you judging them more harshly because of their background? Um, and then some of the resources I think that are the most important are oneself. So kind of your own self-awareness as a fieldwork educator. Have you taken the implicit association test? Again, there's some conversation here that it's not all about implicit bias, but we all have to start somewhere, right? Like understanding even what that is, what that looks like. And then from there, pushing yourself to read literature or engage with occupational therapy reading for people who aren't from the majority um, population. 
um, some other things are getting involved to Dr. Smet's point with communities of practice with people who are diverse. So just some of the things I had listed, there's an OT Practitioners for Solidarity um, Facebook group now. If you're not on social media, CommuneOT has several groups of field work educators and people who are trying to better themselves and educate themselves with one another. Um, Coted Ed, statewide fieldwork consortiums. So not trying to go it on your own, right? Especially if you're somewhere maybe in rural Ohio where there aren't a lot of fieldwork educators or you maybe aren't receiving as many students of color, interacting with people across the country who can help mentor you as a fieldwork educator, um, I think is really important. Thank you. Um, do any of the panelists have anything else to add? Okay. So with that, we will move into our open question and answer session. So we are a large group. We will, we will move into smaller groups. But at this time, as a large group, we wanted to give all of you a chance to ask some questions. So please, um, we want this to be a safe space where you have a chance to ask questions. So please feel free to, to use your uh, video microphone and, and share a question with us, or you can post something to the chat. Do we have an individual who'd be ready to, to ask in the big group? Well, we'll move into our chat. I know there's someone out there with a, with quest, a question they have, which I imagine so many other folks would also love to, to hear the answer to. So don't hesitate. Okay. To Lexi, we had some great questions in the chat earlier. One of the first ones was about what COTAD is doing to help DACA recipients overcome academic barriers. Um, would we like to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, Christina, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of the panelists have a direct, have a, direct, have a, have a response, response or does someone response in the audience, audience have, have also something to share? share. I'll share a little bit. The um, As far as the Hispanic Latino population, which is the largest minority group nationwide, that varies, of course, state by state, city by city, um, but uh, with language access and some of those needs. Um, we have some resources through the COTAD webpage. Uh, Dr. Catherine Hoyt has done a lot of work in this area. We have some, we've had some collaborations over the years too, and so those are still listed there. Um, in terms of uh, DACA recipients in particular and with documentation and um, pathways to citizenship, that's not an area that we have delved into specifically. Um, we have a lot of resources for students, including the chapters, where we are able to provide support and resources for any students um, from disadvantaged backgrounds. We're trying to uh, work on both the recruitment side. We've had a lot of dialogue over these last couple years in holistic admissions and looking at the whole person, the whole applicant, uh, and what unique potential contributions they would bring to an academic program, to um, the body uh, of the, the profession of occupational therapy, but also most importantly to the communities and societies that we serve. And so looking at the statistics, so that I mentioned in the chat that the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Caucus Institute um, is going on this week. It's their first virtual conference due to COVID, which much like AOTA has really expanded accessibility for um, the content. And uh, one, of the, one of the topics that they discussed this morning, I just caught a little snippet because it's been a, a really crazy week. Um, they were talking about how teachers and educators, uh, the Hispanic Latinos make up, I believe it was 20% of students, but only 8% of educators. And they were much more focused on that from um, uh, elementary 
grade school levels. Um, but that is certainly something we see in the OT profession as well, and, and probably even more so of a disparity among um, OT faculty. So we've uh, there's so much work to be done, and we talk about um, over the, the last three or four years that we've been doing Cotet Ed uh, to to try things, to pilot things in your academic programs. Um, often we are sort of islands within our academic programs. And so Cotet Ed has been a place to share resources, share strategies, uh, share ideas and support one another. But when you, when you do something uh, amazing, or maybe it's a flop, but you learned a lot, share it, write it up, publish it, present it, blog it, whatever it may be, share it with the community because um, there's much work to, work to be done. Sorry, that was thank a long response. Thank, no, thank you, Christina. <laughs>
changing this dialogue? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think because we have been trying to respond to what's been going on and the current environment, we've done a lot of, we've done some communicating with field work educators around um, what students may be experiencing. And it doesn't have to be, it can be any and all students. We don't just think about students of color, we think about any student maybe having um, some strong feelings and reaction to what's going on. So we, that was our first approach. And then when something happened, when a student came to us and said, this is what happened, then we um, referred back to what we had already discussed, already sent the Philbrook educator, already discussed in our seminar. So we kind of had that background to work to kind of uh, move from. And then we prepared the student in terms of how would you like to address this? This, this is harmful, it's unacceptable, how would you want to address it? Do you want help in creating a safe space with your fieldwork educator? And so I think giving that information to fieldwork educators help us to establish a common understanding and a common language. Also, that was benefit of doing that. And so when we approach a fieldwork educator, it's with the attitude of we're here to be helpful, we need a safe space so we can all talk about what's going on and then move from there. And this in the case that I'm thinking of, the student said, no, I think now that I've talked it out with you and the student kind of really wanted some validation, like, wait, this happened to me, it was hurtful. Is it okay that I make an issue? And it's like, yeah, it's really okay that you recognize this as hurtful. How would you like to handle it? Can you create a safe space with your fieldwork educator? You can, and then, the, and then that student went forth and handled it on her own. But I think, you know, I don't know how, it's hard to anticipate sometimes how fieldwork educators are gonna respond. Um, and at this point, it's been constructive. If not easy, it's been constructive. Um, and so you just have to hope and pray that it always stays that way. Um, Dr. Saunders Newton and uh, any of the additional panelists, um, a question came in the chat which, which kind of moves this um, question forward and it was, is there a current procedure in place that programs can adopt to help students who may encounter a CI who isn't culturally sensitive or racist? Hmm. Could you repeat that again for me? Yes. So is there a current procedure in place that programs can adopt to help students? Or perhaps how are you supporting students who encounter a CI who isn't culturally sensitive or I assume openly racist? Yeah, we currently don't have a, a particular procedure identified for that particular problem. Um, I think we've, especially since students have been coming to us of late, since we've been very proactive in talking to them, we frame it in terms of the field work relationship. And we make it very much about what are the learning needs of the, of the student, what's not working, what is working. Um, and so we don't really, I think we've just been really using our, the, the usual process that we have, except for um, that process, the specifics are different based on the nature of the problem. Um, and that's worked for us. I'm happy to hear if anyone else is using something different that might be more, more effective. I, can you hear me? Yes, okay, sorry, I had a, I just asked that question earlier, but I just, I don't know, is that unrealistic to, is that something that's unrealistic to ask um, in this point in time? I know there isn't a procedure, but I just, I'm kind of just thinking ahead and um, obviously like, I don't think like clinical instructors would like, it's not something that's up and out of the open, but it's kind of just like the, from the student experience, like this is what I've noticed and this is what I believe is going on. Um, and so I just worry about <laughs> um, like with the current process that's in place now, would students be removed or is it kind of one of those things where they would have to 
um, kind of finish out their field work. I see. Um, so when I've had a situation when a student feels like the environment is untenable, when there it's just too difficult for them to continue, I first have a conversation around what's going on and we name it, we give it a name and we talk about how, you know, we process that experience, what's going on with the student. And then we talk about what they want out of the broke experience. And then we talk about what is possible. Um, and then we talk about what are the steps that we can take as a team to create an environment that will support their learning. And then we talk about, okay, this is, this is kind of what you want. You, this environment is not going to work for you. This is, this is what you need specifically to be in place. So we talk in specific terms about what needs to happen. And then we talk about what are the strategies for making, for communicating this to the fieldwork educator. And then we talk in specific terms, what the, I, the student needs this to be in place to support their education and their learning. Can you provide this? And if the, if the field work educator says, I can't do that, then we talk about another placement. We talk about an alternative. If the field work educator says, I can, then we say, great, here's the learning plan, here's the plan, let's take it a week at a time and see how it goes. Um, so I try and keep it very um, oriented toward what are the needs of the student, the learning needs of the student, and, what, and can you provide those learning needs? Um, and then, you know, it's sometimes field work sites don't work for whatever reason, and it may not work for that reason. And that's, we decided as a team that that's okay if the student says, that doesn't work for me. It won't work for me. We accept that as a valid reason to talk about doing something different. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add? Or are we ready to um, move into our breakouts? Lexi, there was one other question at the very beginning by Tal about everyone having their own truth and how some truth can negatively impact others. Um, potential challenges and solutions. I think uh, Clarissa spoke a little bit to this, but is there any other dialogue um, around that particular area? Tao, do you want to, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Did you have any other questions around that or do you feel like it's been addressed? Okay, well, um, we can move on. I know we're uh, about to transition, but maybe we come back to it in the yeah. a little bit. Um, and, and again, we will reconvene as a large group. And um, so we're gonna try something we haven't tried before right now. And so um, we're gonna give it, a, give it a whirl, see how it goes. But we really wanted you all to have a chance. We're such a large group. And so we wanted you to have a chance to connect with others who might be sharing similar experiences. And so we thought it would be really neat to try to have this large group split into three groups. And so we are going to ask that you all consider now um, entering one of these three Zoom rooms. So this is a Google Doc and it's gonna be a huge shared Google Doc. Um, I'll post it to the chat. And so you'll see on the doc that there is gonna be a Zoom link to the rooms. And so, we're asking fieldwork coordinators to enter into Dr. Arame and Verisade's Zoom room. And, and this doesn't mean that you have to be a fieldwork coordinator to enter this room. This could be that you're interested in this, in this discussion. So it's really discussions centered around um, topics related to fieldwork coordinators. There will be a room for fieldwork educators where you can enter um, into my Zoom room. And then we're asking fieldwork students to remain uh, here on the COTED call. So our hope is that we'll all return again as a big group, but we are gonna ask that you take a, a chance to lead this large group um, to be able to um, share thoughts and ideas 
with those who may be experiencing similar situations or questions right now. So could you please move on to the next slide, Stephanie? In these breakout rooms, we're gonna ask that you share responses to these three questions. These questions are listed on the Google Doc. And so again, it's, a, it's an open space for everyone. So please type in things that are occurring. Maybe you'd like to select a note taker or two, or maybe just jot as things are coming out. Um, so we, we can really have an, an open dialogue that is available to all of us and um, shares resources, share, shares ideas, shares questions across um, so many different experiences. And so we can continue to try to, to work to respond to um, things that are so important to you all as our um, community of attendees. So we're gonna again ask you to continue th these discussions around racism and discrimination and field work within the context that you are experiencing. And then we're gonna think about that action item. So as Dr. Arame and Virasade mentioned, the Ignite series is action focused. So we really truly would like to see what you are planning to implement in the next four weeks to begin moving your own experience forward. And then we'll just ask that maybe someone from your group, if, if someone is comfortable, possibly being a spokesperson. Again, we'll come back to that large space and we'll all have the Google Doc. So we'll you know, have access to those notes, but I think it'd be great if we as a large group could reconvene and talk through some of those things. So does anyone have any questions? Are we ready to head on out to our rooms? What time to come back? <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, 7.40 is gonna be um, the large group return time. So we'll try to help guide. If you happen to leave this space, Dr. Roman Rosade or I will try to say, okay, go back, go back. And we'll make sure you have the link to return. All right, so students hey, stay in the show, please. <laughs> we'll see the other two groups back here in 30 minutes. Thank you, Stephanie. Hey Stephanie, this is Lauren. I'm here with you. I'm happy to be the note taker if you want to guide the discussion. Or good, good. You wanna... Yes, I will take you up on it. Fantastic. Oh, there you go. I was like, where, where are you? <laughs> yes, I, I keep my camera off because sometimes it affects my internet. Yes, well, hello. All right, so let's see. We still have, I'm waiting to see if people head out of this group or if we're going to end up with so many that we're going to want to go in breakout sessions, I think. And I think the latter will be the case. Okay, so I'm going to put put people in breakout sessions. And what we can do is if if just one person or could be more than one in each breakout session can click on the link and go to the Google Doc, then we can um at the same time take notes on the same document so synchronously that's the word i was looking for all right give me one second we're gonna break out Okay, here we go. If you would accept the invitation to head to your breakout room and we will co come back at 7.40, I'll send a message to you giving you a little warning. Um, Marie Lynn, so we are dividing up into um, three big groups. One is for fieldwork educators so people who might be called clinical instructors, CIs. One is for academic fieldwork coordinators, so the faculty members. And this one is for fieldwork students, or you can choose which group you go to. You can go to the one that describes you or just the discussion that interests you most. Um, this discussion is gonna be around fieldwork student issues and I have sent um, invitations to breakout rooms. So if you would accept that invitation, we're gonna do this discussion in breakout rooms. Yep. 
Okay, Tara. I am not sure what to tell you. Usually on a phone, you should get that invitation too. You I don't may think any of us got it. Nobody got the invitation? No, nobody got the invitation. Okay. I just got oh, it right it now. just came through. Okay. It just came through. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, you guys. It's Stephanie again. Um, you had a couple fewer people than the other group, so I thought I would join in this group, and I hope that's okay. Um, so we do have um, those guiding questions that were um, issued out, and we can kind of go by that to talk about our topics that we've been assigned. And, and I can kind of um, say things and um, take notes unless somebody else really wants to. Here is our list of prompts. Um, the first one is, what are some of the challenges centered around racism and discrimination within the context of field work that you have had or you might be experiencing them now? What have you seen or experienced out there as far as racism and discrimination against students on field work? Um, hi, Stephanie. My name is Asha um, from hi. USC. Um, Thank you for going first. Yeah, thought I'd give it a shot. Um, yeah. One of the experiences I had when I was observing for shadowing hours, another fieldwork student who identified as African American and female, she was working, this is a hand clinic, um, and it was a lot of geriatric patients, uh, and one of the older male clients ended up asking the therapist if she was allowed to be there. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So what happened with that? The therapist ended up just explaining that, of course, she's allowed to be there. She's an occupational therapy student. Um, she asked him why he was asking that question. And then he kind of just got very awkward. And he was just kind of like, oh, oh never mind. I just wanted to make sure she was, he was, she was here for the right reasons or something like that. Um, but he made it very obvious that he was asking because of her ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, the therapist didn't really address it in front of me, at least. Maybe she had a conversation behind the doors later with the student, but that was basically it. Yeah, that can, it can be really challenging to address discrimination with a client um, because in some ways, you know, they're our customer, but um, again, we need to create a safe space. And so it, that's our responsibility as well. Um, does anybody else want to add to that? Something you've seen or if you yourself have experienced mm -hmm. something on field work? Um, Hi. Oh, oh Steph, are you going to go? I can go ahead. Um, I okay. Guess, in all honesty, I ha don't know that I have witnessed yeah. or experienced it. And that's part of the reason why I'm here. So I just, just to learn more about it and some of the experiences that people have encountered and if there's a way that I can handle a future situation um, and just kind of a, get a better knowledge on how to approach situations like that. And so that's kind of where I'm at, I guess. That's, that's great. I'm so glad you're here. Casey, what about you? Um, I was going to say similar to stuff. We haven't had a lot of experience yet with field work, just with COVID, things have kind of got messy with our program. We haven't been able to see a lot. Um, but in class the other day, one of my friends was sharing, um, she 
was working in a geriatric setting with a client who every time she would try to tell her to do things, she'd be like, she would ignore her and she would look to a, like a PT, someone else. And she's like, what should I be doing? Cause our, my friend is like colored. So she was at first not aware of why the geriatric patient wasn't paying attention to her. And then it came up during one of their lunch hours. She was just bringing it up that this client never adheres to what I'm saying to her. And the PT said, well, yeah, it, it is the color of your skin. Like she's brought that up to us before. And my friend just mentioned that like, she was internalizing it as that she wasn't a good therapist and that's why the client wasn't adhering to what she was saying but really it was the color of her skin and that was just like hard for her to kind of handle that situation so it's just it's stuff that comes up that a lot of us aren't aware of you know yeah yeah for sure and you know what microaggressions are, are sometimes things that can be even nonverbal um Asha, you talked about that, or you mentioned that, um, and that can be every bit as cutting as, or sometimes maybe more so than actual um, words that are spoken. Um, have you guys seen or heard about some, uh, um, a, a white patient who refuses to work with a, a, a practitioner or a student of color? I, I've experienced that a lot. I mean, I've seen it. I've witnessed it, I should say. Um, and it's it's quite disconcerting. It's I, I find it interesting, the different verbiage and ways that different people handle that. Um, I will say how I have learned to handle it in my career, later in my career, is to say something to the effect of, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I hear your concerns. Um, I can tell you though that this student or practitioner is highly qualified. In fact, maybe one of the best people in this building to help you with that skill. And so let's, let's go forward and um, see if we can really address this challenge that you're having. Now, of course, if, if somebody is really being ugly, angry, and, and if I get a sense or direct message from the person that's being discriminated against that they are not comfortable, then all bets are off. Um, this would be just, you know, if it was a minor thing, if somebody was like, well, I'm not sure she's the best one for me or something more subtle like that, then I try to reassure and smooth things over. And you know, it's like everything else. If, if two people can connect one-on-one, -on -one, it seems like discrimination really is very minimized. Um, it becomes less of a bias or an assumption about that person and more just realizing we're both just people. Um, I definitely have seen that though. Um, do you guys have any other thoughts about how to handle that or how you thinking about how what you might do if you witnessed anywhere somebody getting discriminated against? Any thoughts? Honestly, I feel like what you said, it's a really good teaching moment for us. Um, when my friend shared that in class, one of the professors had mentioned the PT should have taken that as a chance for himself to really teach that client and say, you know, she's just as qualified as we are. There's no difference in the treatment that you're getting. Um, so I think being able to take that step and really like address it right away, not let it pass by or just kind of blow it over when mm -hmm. they hear those comments right away. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is in some settings, there isn't another option. You know, if, if you're, I was a school-based OT for 20 years. Um, before before I came into OT, to teach in an OT program, and I was the only OT in the school. So if somebody didn't want me for whatever reason, it was kind of tough luck for them. I mean, they weren't going to bring in somebody else just because somebody didn't like me. Um, but it can make it very very uncomfortable for the person that's being discriminated against. I mean, especially if you think about it, like in a home health situation or even in a skilled nursing facility or rehab facility where the, the clinician or the student are going into that person's room and working on ADLs with them, it's pretty up close and personal. And 
if somebody is acting aggressively towards you or very dismissive or disrespectful, you know, it's very uncomfortable. So I think it's always, you know, you have to protect and make sure that th there's safety and a, a certain level of comfort, um, but also to kind of smooth things over if that's established. Um, have you guys um, had much discussion about how to handle this in your OT program? We have tried to facilitate the conversation and it's slowly starting to get bigger. I think it's just, it's really awkward for both sides of the identities. You know, everybody who identifies as white and Caucasian, they want to be able to help us. Uh, those who identify as BIPOC and they want to be able to like be our allies. But then the challenge I think they're facing is, do we ask these individuals to share their experiences over and over again and put the work on their back when they already have to deal with so much within their own identity? Or do we try to learn on our own and kind of experiment in terms of yeah. equipping ourselves with that skill? So that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It, you know, it can be so, so tricky to, you know, you can have a million case studies or like scenarios that teachers love to give. And sometimes it still won't really get it. You know, there's still something crazy that happens in the field that you are just underprepared for, but you have to just do your best. And what I tell my students is it's okay to be awkward or to feel awkward. You just have to do something. Um, you know, I've seen this quote out really over the past six months um, that inaction is sometimes this just as bad as um, you know, as actually doing the aggression or the discrimination. Um, and I think that's something that's really spoken to me that I've made a pledge to myself that I, I'm never just going to be quiet or, you know, if somebody tells a, an inappropriate joke around me, even if it's a friend of mine or a superior, I mean, that mm -hmm. happens, that I'm going to say mm -hmm. that's discriminatory, that's hurtful to people. Um, and it, it, I do understand though that for students mm. that can be especially tricky. Um, I have heard from some students in the past who have experienced discrimination um, and harassment on field work or even in their OT programs and their message is that sometimes there's not a single person on their faculty that they feel comfortable bringing it to. They feel like, you know, they, they might get failed or, you know, graded down or, you know, a lot of programs will um, give you critique on your professionalism and they might say, oh, she's a big crybaby because, you know, she came and said someone said this. Um, and that in and of itself is another microaggression. So, you know, I think for you guys, maybe something to do is to you know kind of do what i did and make a pledge and don't just be a bystander but if you're in a situation that it might create problems for you yourself you can at least support the person who is getting discriminated against and you know make sure they don't sit by themselves at lunch or you know say i mean you could go with them to an administrator's office you can go to the office of diversity that most you know universities have and or help them figure out how to file a complaint if it's a faculty member. Um, do you all have any other thoughts on that? Um, I was just gonna add, I'm Hannah, by the way, the one whose screen this is. Um, okay. She's in my class and her computer kicked her off. <laughs> well, I'm glad y'all are together. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're actually also in the class with Casey who gave the example of our classmate. Um, so I guess I, so one thing she had mentioned um, was that she felt, you know, she took it internally and was saying like, oh, I'm not a good um, CODA or whatever, you know, I'm not doing my job right. Why is this person not liking me? So then as the PT who this client told the information to that she like, because it was, or that it was because of the color of her, her skin, mm -hmm. how do you like, um, she kind of had mentioned how she wished she would have known that sooner so if some if a client say or anybody is coming to us saying things like that i know we talked about like 
giving or using that moment as like a teaching moment to them but then how do, would you say maybe recommend going about telling then the person they're talking about so that this person isn't internalizing it or like being there for them i don't want to be the only one talking on this i want to give you yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah so let, what do you guys think i mean th i don't think there's any specific right answer you know there's a lot of different ways you could handle it. I think a big thing is to do something. Right. Yeah. What about you guys? Y'all have any response to Hannah? Um, hi, Hannah. I, my name is Asha, by the way. I don't know if hi. I said that. Yeah, yeah no. you did. <laughs> um, cool. Um, for me, if I was in that situation and you were like on the team, I would want you to like, let me know like directly, like maybe like after hours or something like one-on-one. -on -one um just let me know like what the situation is um just so that like i have an awareness and then i would probably either maybe come up with a game like a game plan with you just in case like i need like someone to have my back if you're like okay with that mm -hmm. or i would probably go to like the ot supervisor um just because i feel like again like in those situations like no one wants to get like docked for like field work points no one wants to like you know have any like awkward situations or situations that get out of hand um but like just that transparency would be super helpful because like you would be on a team right that's kind of what i was wondering too is like would you go to the supervisor and say you know but i mean i i think like you're saying probably coming directly to you is like a good first step yeah and doing I, that also yeah just yeah. letting it be known that that's the case yeah i i mean i think either way it would work like if i'm like thinking about it i'm like the UIC standpoint, if you went to my field work coordinator, they would probably like have a one on one with me and let me know. If you let me know, then I would be like, okay, can I like, you know, is it okay if I come to you because like, you know, you're the one that let me know this and I can count on you or do you think I should go to the supervisor. Um, but I don't think there's like um, Stephanie said I don't think there's a wrong or right way to handle the situation. Yeah, it can be very tricky. And sometimes you do have to use your skills to read the nonverbal, you know, it can be their body language, their tone of voice, you know, things like that, um, that can let you know, is it just a, an attitude of racism? Or is there actual aggression and threat there, um, which would elevate things to a whole nother level, of course. Um, what are some other thoughts that you guys think of? Hi, I'm Tessa. Um, so Hi. something that I've been thinking about too is just kind of how we're taught to, you know, learn about our clients and accept them for their cultural background and whatever comes along with it. So then finding that balance of like, you know, protecting yourselves as therapists and like, um, like if someone's being, you know, racist or prejudiced, like how, it's just, I, I think that will be a difficult balance to find, like how you can protect yourself while still respecting your client as that's our responsibility to do so. But we still need to respect ourselves. Um, and then recognizing that when it becomes an issue for our coworkers. Um, yeah, that's just something I was thinking that's about. That's a really good point. I mean, you know, as an OT educator, I harp on cultural humility and awareness of your client and respect. and. You know, when you write those occupational profiles, you're supposed, you have to put the client, you know, what if something in there is that, you know, someone says something like, well, I hate black people, you know, or something really racist like that, you know, I mean, do you guys have thoughts on that? I'm trying to think how I would handle that in a clinical situation. Some of it depends on the setting. If there are a lot of other people around, I would feel a lot more comfortable, but if I were like in their home as a home health therapist, it would be a lot different. Um, I, th I think for me in like, I'm um, like, you're talking about kind of making a pledge to like not to do something. That's kind of something that I've tried to do for myself also is to just not be a passive observer and call it out. And I think in that situation, it would be appropriate. So like you had said, maybe someone wrote, said something in their uh, profile, like that they don't like black people and maybe just like prompting that conversation. Like, you know, I heard you say this and I'm kind of curious about it. Can you let me know? And I guess even just starting a conversation is better than ignoring it. Um, not that we're there to change people's minds about <laughs> being racist, but I don't know, like questioning them in a like respectful way, I guess, while still providing them care is 
I don't know, maybe a good way to go about it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, this kind of relates back to that statement made in the big group earlier where they said, you know, everybody has their own truth. And I, I mean, everybody has our own experiences that have led to the degree of cultural humility that we have. And, you know, some of us, I grew up in a very racist place and it's taken me a long time to um, educate myself. Um, and I mean, I kind of always knew that was wrong, but I had to get out of that town when I went to college and kind of, you know, get, make friends with people who are different from me and not just skin color, but certainly including that. Um, and, and, you know, I think it goes back to what everybody's experience and viewpoint is, you know, that's, it's to a certain extent you have to respect or maybe just realize that that's there. Um, but but to to do something to say something and sometimes i'll say to uh, someone whether it's a client or someone else that maybe says a racist joke or word and i'll say you know from from my experience it's we're just all people or something you know or if, if it's about a specific person like i don't want to work with him because of this i'll say you know i've gotten i've had the privilege of getting to know him and he has the coolest background you know, where I, I try to make it where I'm just stating my own truth, not scolding or correcting the person. And I hope that that, you know, then makes the person think, well, maybe I should talk to them, you know, and especially if whatever I'm saying relates to something that the person who's being racist, like if they have a military background, for example, and I might say, you might not know this, but he was in the army for 25 years. And, you know, I had lunch with him the other day and he told me that it just blew me away because he looks so young or something like that. Or, you know, I'd, I'd never heard him talk about it, but he fought in Iraq. And, and so then those two people go from being really different in, in one person's mind to having something similar. You know, you could even say like, he likes dogs. I know you like dogs or he has six grandchildren like you do, you know, something like that to kind of bridge the gap. Um, Sometimes that works. Any other thoughts on that or questions or concerns you guys have? We just have about four minutes left. I think something cool that I've seen at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago is that sometimes when there's like a limited number or like a less number of OTs who are of people of color um, is the Caucasian OTs will help emphasize like the aha moments um, so like often like when you have like clients who you've been working with for a really long time, they hit that breakthrough. Um, if the clients that they're working with have made like racist comments, exclusionary comments, have been super dismissive, um, and finally that client hits like a breakthrough moment in their OT, like therapy and their, their treatment, mm -hmm. then like some of the Caucasian therapists will like be like, huh, guess you like didn't think that they could do that, right? Um, and it's a, just a real big shocker for the client for like a couple of minutes or like a couple of days. And then like some clients have come back and apologized actually for their behavior and others have just like kind of just swallowed their pride and just like, okay, I guess I put my foot in my mouth. Um, but that's kind of something like maybe you could wait for too, depending on what the context is, obviously. Yeah, that's really true. I'll tell you uh, something that I have witnessed in some students that I have known is an assumption that, and it isn't necessarily somebody of color, but sometimes it is, an assumption that if they're late to a session or if they don't show up, that they don't care or they don't value the services. And I mean, I, I have heard that a number of times from people. And, and what I'll say is, you know, I, I, I have thought like that, but in getting to know some people with different backgrounds, what I've learned is that some people have hardships that we don't know about. Like they, they may not have reliable transportation. They may not have bus fare. They sure can't, you know, pay for an Uber or you know, drive their car. They may not have childcare. They, you know, they, they may have a whole lot of things going on that we have no idea about. Um, and, and, you know, I try to say it in a way again, that's not, scolding or like I think I'm know everything because goodness knows I don't um, 
you know, I just kind of put it out there as to how I learned it or what, what sometimes I'll even talk about things like in my early days as an OT, I worked at a pediatric children's hospital and I remember going into patient rooms at maybe 11 o'clock to get the kid to bring them to the rehab room and the room would be dark. There'd be several family members there and everybody'd have their sleeping clothes on. And I would think, what is wrong with these people? They need to get up. Their child is sick. They need to turn the lights on. And it wasn't until, you know, I had an experience with a family member in the hospital and spent the night with them that I, it really dawned on me how disruptive it is at night in the hospital. And you know how those people were doing the best they could. I'm sure they were exhausted. And, you know, just, I mean, even just the stress of that kind of thing can make you so tired. And um, I just didn't know. And, you know, it's like that Maya Angelou quote, when you know better, you'll do better. And I mean, I honestly say that to myself almost every day. And sometimes I think it's good just to talk about mistakes that we have made or people we know have made and, and then say, but then I learned this, or then I realized this. So, you know, I'm not framing myself as being perfect by any stretch. Um, so, well, we are at 740. I have so, I, I feel like we could talk for another hour at least. Um, I always feel that way about breakout sessions. Um, I have so enjoyed getting to talk to you guys. There's still one more thing, and I want you guys to just think about this. We've talked, touched on a little bit is what's an action item that you can do maybe in the next several weeks to help, you know, be an ally or to you know, demonstrate that you are anti-racist or even just learn more about struggles and challenges that people have on field work. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things out there and I think we're going to talk about some of those in the breakout room, but just kind of food for thought. COTAD is really big on being action oriented. We don't want to just have an information session or a talk about it. Like we all recognize there's a problem or we wouldn't be on this Zoom tonight. Um, but we want to each do something in our little corner of the world. If, and if we all do that, there'll be enough corners that things might change. So little food for thought. All right. Well, it looks like people are going back in the big room. So I'll see y'all back in there. Thank I've you. enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. all. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We are just waiting. It seems like our numbers are slowly growing. Um, we were lucky we didn't have to um, stay in or go to another. We just got to stay here. So um, let's give people a chance to come back. And then we're going to discuss as a big group. Thank you everybody for coming back. Glad to see you back. Thank you everybody for coming back. We are gonna get started back in just a minute. We're waiting on a few more folks to hop back over.
So while we wait on um, the last few groups to come back, I'd like to encourage you to think about an action that you can take over the next month or so um, on just in your little corner of the world to address racism and discrimination. Um, something you could learn, something you could do, something you could say, someone you could connect with. And there's lots of different avenues you could go down, but something you could do to mm. ignite change. That's why we're here. And, and COTAD is really big on action orientation. And we want to move beyond just talking about things, just thinking about things to what can we do. And our idea is that if enough of us do that in our, in our corners, that there'll be lots of coverage that isn't there now. So if you wanna just be thinking about that, you could even write a measurable goal for yourself if you want. We are going to discuss that in just a minute. There is a inspirational quote that is in the in the chat box if you would like to read that and have some food for thought. Here we've got a big group coming back. All right, just a few more seconds. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. I guess we could start sharing uh, a little bit with what happened in our group. We could start discussing a little bit uh, with the fieldwork coordinator. I mean, uh, yeah, coordinators group. Uh, anyone who was in, in this group, feel free to share any summaries or any discussions or any highlights. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the challenges specifically also with uh, the pandemic and social unrest and how to uh, really empower students to understand some of the non-traditional experiences can also be uh, beneficial and can prepare them for skills in the workforce that may 
be in the future with telehealth and telework. So that's something that we were able to discuss. Several uh, talked about certain actions that they're going to be creating, uh, developing such as trainings on potential uh, areas like how to handle microaggressions. Uh, anybody else from the group, please feel free to, to share also some of the other things. But that's just, I know briefly wanted to give a quick summary, but we had a fantastic group of over 32 individuals who are amazing fieldwork coordinators and really passionate about supporting student needs and making sure that students have uh, really good supportive experiences. So that's a little bit from us. Awesome, thanks. Did the student group already go? Did I miss? No, not yet. I mean, we actually had so many that we went into a bunch of different breakout rooms. So everybody was adding to the Google Doc. And I'll just kind of um, break the seal and share one something we talked about in the group I was in. Um, we talked about taking a pledge or making a pledge, um, even if just to ourselves, about not doing nothing. So in other words, to not speak in double negatives, um, to do something, to say something if we, if we witness racism or discrimination, that whether it's to um, support the person who's experiencing that or to say something to try to mitigate the situation, um, just to do something, because sometimes our tendency is to, to be silent or to wait because it's awkward or hard, and we're, we're going to work towards not doing that. Very cool. I love it. And I love what I'm seeing coming in this, the, um, the chat too. Um, and what's put on the Google Doc. That's great. I'm so glad we'll have this all to continue to reference and share. And please continue to feel free. Keep adding to that as you're writing down your goals. How about from our educator clinician group? That would be us, I think. Um, so uh, I'll start with what I recall because we had an interesting group of uh, predominantly students in the, the, that were kind of lumped into that group. And uh, I, I'm a, a program director, I'm not an academic field work coordinator, but uh, um, so it was very rich hearing from the students in terms of what would be meaningful for them to prepare them in terms of going out on their clinicals. And uh, probably one of the, the, the ideas that, that was discussed the most was um, using students to educate students, uh, using it more of a peer uh, model. So uh, having students who had been out on fieldwork uh, coming back and sharing their own experiences uh, with the uh, next groups going out. And um, some kind of uh, 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 details around that that were discussed was uh, the preference that students had to have uh, an academic person or an academic field or coordinator kind of facilitate and start some discussion, but then also leave time where um, that person would leave the room so that students could kind of uh, be on their own and, and kind of feel safe and comfortable uh, talking with each other and really just kind of giving each other advice and encouragement in terms of how to uh, uh, navigate uh, through some of the you know those sensitive areas out there how to deal with a, a fieldwork educator who might have some uh, triggering statements or things like that um, and, and, and how to how to uh, work through that and uh, Chris I don't know if you had other thoughts to add to that yeah. I was so obsessed thinking about what I need to do that <laughs> great well that's a, you know something we hope happens in this session yeah. um, okay. to kind of respond to that um, the the group of um, clinicians who were discussing um, sort of opportunities for preparation for training within one another. Um, does someone from that group want to share from my Zoom room? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, so we mainly talked about, you know, what type of, what, how, what type of education or, you know, what education would look like for uh, clinical educators who are out in the field. And there was a few ideas, um, but the, still the question sort of remain in terms of how to support and prepare fieldwork educators um, in, the, in the best way. Um, so we talked about, you know, recruitment of, um, of folks who are uh, non-white um, within, within the, the system. Um, 
uh, some questions that came up. So how do practitioners cope when they experience uh, racism and how can they share this guidance and support with students? So that mentorship piece there. Um, we also talked about sort of the clinical sites themselves uh, having uh, training. So not just the field work educator, but also the folks who are working with the students because we work in teams oftentimes. And so students are not only learning from the clinical educator themselves, but from the team that they're working with as well. So um, that would be important. We talked about um, how to manage situation encountered uh, in, in the actual field work. So from like a clinical educator perspective. So what should the response be? How do we, how do, how do we broach um, those topics or facilitate those topics with students? Because again, you know, it might not just necessarily be the clinical educator who's involved in that, but if the student perhaps experiences um, racism or discrimination from patients or from members of the team, right? So there's the, we talked a lot about the clinical educator being a key educator, right? We don't think about like the, the pedagogy um, behind that. And so maybe that there's some pedagogical training that can, that can happen there. Um, we talked a lot about the power dynamics and sort of the, you know, how to, how to be aware of those as a clinical educator, but also um, teach about that and, and model that as well. Um, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, for sharing that from our group. Yep. Um, and again, that Google Doc is available. We will make it into a PDF and post it um, as a resource for you all. And before we move into our closing, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to add or share anything? Before we move, we have about one minute before we can move into our closing. I have a quick question, but it's kind of awkward, I guess. How do you deal with colorism, um, like in those situations in a field work? Because, I mean, it happens, and then if your field work educator is Caucasian or their supervisor is also Caucasian, then it just gets extra sticky of a situation. And this is Lauren. I think it would depend on, um, and if people aren't familiar with the term colorism, it essentially means ascribing um, different assumptions about someone's competency based on the color of their skin. Typically, people with lighter skin tones, more um, European, more Caucasian are viewed as more competent, more able. And people with darker skin tones are viewed as um, more dangerous, less able. So just a quick overview. Um, I think the colorism would depend on kind of how, I'm trying to think of what I want to say about this. So potentially the colorism could work to the effect of having a fieldwork educator believe that a student was more capable or more ready than what they felt they were able to do and putting pressure on them in that sense, which is detrimental, or it could be working in the way that the fieldwork educator assumes that a student is less able because of the color of their skin. So it's a little difficult to say either way the student is put in a position of having to respond based on somebody's assumptions about them rather than what they're actually objectively capable of doing. So either, however the situation is experienced, it's a detriment. Um, it's a lot harder to prove that that's what somebody's perspective is, certainly. So that is difficult to get at. But even if you're a student in that situation, noticing that there's a disconnect, something that, um, I found helpful is having a weekly check-in as a fieldwork student and as a fieldwork coordinator, depending on the length of it with a level one fieldwork, it might not be possible, but certainly over 12 weeks or more, the expectation that at least twice a month, there would be a check-in as far as where do you think, you know, the student would rate themselves, like here's how I think I'm performing, the fieldwork coordinator would rate, fieldwork educator rather would rate, here's where I think you're performing, if they're about the same, okay, if they're not, so the fieldwork educator is thinking, okay, well, I think you should be here. It's been three weeks. You should be doing X, Y, and Z independently. And the student is saying, I don't feel comfortable with that at all. We're at two completely different places. Maintaining that open communication is a way to help adjust for any concern, whether it is about racism or something else that might be happening. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other feedback. Um, thank you, Lauren. And 
please continue that feedback. And that's one of the things I'm sorry to cut, cut short. I just trying to be mindful of time for all of us. Um, one of the things we hope to continue to do in COTAD is provide those spaces to ask those questions and try to give you access to those who can give some feedback. Um, so we'll move back into the slides. Stephanie, to move into our closing at this time. And thank you, Lauren, and thank you to all of our panelists, Dr. Smet, Dr. Lucas, um, Dr. Saunders-Newton. We're so, um, so glad that we could have this all occur tonight. So um, as we're moving in, uh, moving on to our closing here. What I think I would like to do is um, give Dr. Aranme and Verizade a chance to um, thank all of you for attending the second series of Ignite. All right, well, thank you so much for all of the panelists for sharing your experience, your expertise, and your stories. Thank you to the COTAT leaders who facilitated a breakout group. I do wanna say that field work is an extremely important aspect of a student's occupational therapy education. You one can think that it's also a gatekeeper to the profession is one aspect of it. As a student being supported, prepared and provided with the tools to succeed is critical for a good learning experience. Now when discrimination and racism enters the realm, it is not, not only creates a traumatic experience, but it also can be detrimental to the student being able to complete their OT education. It is so important as academic fieldwork educators and coordinators to have strategy and skills in place to support a student who may be experiencing these issues, as well as for students to have resources to seek out if they feel they are experiencing racism and or discrimination. As I reflect on today's event, I am so, so proud to see this powerful and very important series continue to grow. When I think about COTAD and our mission, this is who we are and this is what we represent, action. We are for the community, for the people, and we believe by being grassroots and by taking action, we will be the change we want to see. Thank you all for engaging, for joining us on this journey and for your energy tonight. We are forever grateful for your voice and for your stories. As always, whenever I leave, whenever I say anything, I wanna say keep that same energy, empower, organize, and mobilize, even when the trend is up. I leave you with this quote, to bring about change, you must not be afraid to take the step first step. We will fail when we try, when we fail to try by Miss Rosa Parks. Uh, I will leave it with Dr. Rebney. We'll share more about our upcoming events really, really, really quickly. Yes. Thank you Thank all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anversade. So again, make sure to follow our COTED media. Make sure to look onto our COTED webpage to find those resources on anti-racism. This is an extensive list we want to make available to all for use in a variety of contexts. So make sure to check that out. Next slide. We also are trying something new on our COTED Ed page. So this is um, a space that we want to, again, have um, an opportunity for educators to share resources. So please post on this Padlet. This is an open Padlet on this website. Um, I'm gonna, I'll add the link to the chat to the exact page. Um, so make sure if you have something you've come across in um, you know, resources that might be valuable for others, add them to that Padlet. Um, again, this is our COTED Ed page where there are additional resources listed. Next slide. As we continue those spaces that are available to share those conversations with one another, um, we wanted to draw your attention to our COTAD Book Plus Club. Um, this is a discussion platform for those who would like to dive into those discussions um, to explore media related to social justice, racial justice, and anti-racism. So make sure to check this out. We have an event coming up next week. If it's something you'd like to um, check out the podcast and then attend this event and share conversations about it, we welcome you. So that wraps up our second session of Ignite 2, and we would love to see you back on October 8th. And this is where we will explore pathways to occupational therapy and OT student support. Um, this is really a place where we'll be talking about those, um, those pathways that supports that's needed to um, make our workforce a, a supported and diverse place um, for future students and for our current um, students enrolled in occupational therapy education programs. So we'll see you here back in a few weeks, three weeks. And um, thank you to all who attended tonight. The link for registration will be available on our Ignite website soon. Thank you all. Have a great night.
Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. Yay. <laughs> posted on protab.org, the protab website, within the next day or two. All right, we're down to the core. <laughs> Thank you all so much for all those things. Turn the off chat. the recording, y'all. Turn off the recording so we can don't have to edit that much. <laughs> I'm recording. All right, so does everyone have the Google Doc up? I'm pulling it back up on my computer, letting individuals in. Give us a second. Um, give me one second to pull up the doc again. All right. So if there's anyone who wants to be a note taker, just say, let me know in the chat if you want to be that person or if you want to be our, uh, I see people are in this, if you want to be our spokesperson, uh, go ahead and be the field work educator, I mean, coordinator, spokesperson, crew for us. I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> anyone who wants to do that. Uh, our first question is, what are some of the challenges centered around racism and discrimination within the context of field work that you are experiencing? And um, I guess it's interesting because we're all coming from all different parts of the country. So if anybody wants to start sharing some of the challenges in around racism and discrimination, as I mentioned in my opening, it's intersectionality. There's so many different areas that we are experiencing as field work coordinators <laughs> when it comes to this question. I'll also take some notes. Any challenges, anyone? I know there are some challenges. Oh, I know. <laughs> so I can talk. So one of the challenges we've been facing is getting our students to talk to us about when these things happen and how to create those um, brave spaces, we're calling them, um, are brave spaces where the students feel comfortable talking about what they're experiencing. Because most of them are, especially at this point, just glad to have a field work and they just want to finish. <laughs> they don't want to make anything harder than it already is. Um, so we're hearing like through the grapevine from roommates of people, like things like that, that there are issues. So we're just trying to figure out how to empower students to speak up. I don't know if anyone's had anything groundbreaking they've been doing, but. The speaking up part is, is a big, is a big deal. And it's, and, and when I was field recording, I was also teaching specific classes that were called Fieldwork 1 and Fieldwork 2. So it really helped me personally build that specific rapport and that connection and that mentorship with every single one of my students where I knew so much more about them, but I'm, I'm cons they felt very comfortable being able to share. But I'm curious to hear how individuals who may not be really connecting with students uh, on a daily basis like that or may not uh, and may have larger cohorts, how are you handling what Mandy spoke about? Because that's a real, real, real thing and issue is that they're scared to speak up because they just want to get by 
which I get. So I just wanted to point out, I think, um, and I'm calling, um, I'm Allison, the Peel Work Coordinator from NYU. And like your program, uh, we have something similar where you have a seminar uh, that kind of is connected to the experience. And I think having those conversations very early, you know, in the program so that it sets the tone and it's the consistent message so that by the time they reach to level two fieldwork where you barely are seeing them, right? You know, they're already conditioned to kind of reaching out to you when situations like that arise. Um, it's hard to do it retro, mm -hmm. but it's definitely easier when you kind of set that tone every time you have that seminar kind of dialogue. So like for us, what I have found to have worked is identifying kind of community guidelines in terms of what we can discuss in a safe space in the seminar class um, so that people can feel heard, safe, and supported with things that they want to discuss and bring up um, and kind of mutually all agreeing on what those guidelines should be. Um, and I think reiterating those guidelines every time that we meet for seminar has been really helpful in kind of establishing that rapport that students need to feel comfortable to kind of have and bring up those topics as they progress. Because it may not happen at all during level one, but that lo and behold, it manifests on level two. So I think that for me, that has worked. Again, it's not a catch-all. Um, and some people will always still kind of be mute um, until a situation presents itself, unfortunately, right? And then you're trying to do all this kind of damage control later on. So for me, that has what that is what works. Um, but again, it's not a one size fits all solution. Anyone else? That was excellent, actually. Um, it definitely isn't a one size fits all. Okay, Corey, I don't know yeah. because that's your name, sorry. Yeah, no, that, I, it's Corey. I'm from, <laughs> I'm, I'm with you from Canada. Um, I'm the, oh, field, oh, I know. Hi. I'm the field work <laughs> coordinator up here in Edmonton, Alberta, and I would just build on what Allison was saying. I think I handle it very similarly. Um, and I have over the years collected a couple of stories of when I've needed to be an ally and a support to a student in a field work situation where I do feel like they were being mistreated. And I found a way to do a bit of storytelling in the seminars so that the students can get a bit of a flavor for how I have had that student's back. Um, I tell a story about a time that I actually ultimately removed a student from a placement because I felt like they were not being treated appropriately. I explain the intervention a little bit. So I do take the initiative to go into some detail. Um, and I, I think that helps, but I would, I would also agree with Mandy that I still have students come to me after the fact and say, my friend told me I should come tell you that I wasn't treated very well on my placement, right? So I, I don't have the solution, but I agree with Allison that that's, a, that's an important start. It's definitely about them trusting and seeing us as approachable, um, open people who demonstrate and mentor social justice in our own practices. Yes, I have a question also. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for joining us from Canada. <laughs> I love that. Uh, what about, uh, I'm not sure if there's any field work coordinators here that are, that are new to the role. Like I remember being brand new and at the time and there was a student a, a black male student who was having some serious you automatically want to say okay maybe they're having an understanding the skill not getting it and the field work educators right and let's do a learning contract and then you do the learning contract but you don't realize the underlying issue is that this is truly the field work educator who's creating the problem and i remember having to really learn from that experience to say because i was like look, going to on the student at first like what's going on da, 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 you know why you know and i had to really sit back and that was me being a rook no one trained us on how to be field coordinators and really understanding how to just decipher if there are some underlying issues with racism and discrimination and i made a promise to myself after that situation that i was never sending students to that site i don't care if it's level one or two because i had another student at that site who said that the person was condescending to them and was disrespectful and the students were traumatized and there's no need to put students in these situations but i had to learn that sometimes doing the learning contract and having these conversations um one time is not is not is not 
where you're gonna be able to find the underlying issue where sometimes their friends come and tell you or whatnot, but you really have to pull it apart and listen to what the student is trying to share with you they might not even realize it themselves yet, and they may just be scared. Has anyone experienced this challenge? Okay, I see, yes. <laughs> okay. It, it's, it's hard when you're new and, and when, you're, when you're learning and trying to gain experience and build rapport with sites so they could continue to take your students and, and, and whatnot. So though that's one of my challenges, but I had to learn from that and really it was able to gain experience from that situation. Is there any other challenges that anyone wants to share? Hi, yes, go ahead. Hi, I see you, uh, Efekona. Yes, Efekona, okay? e thank you. Hi, um, welcome. A special nice, shout nice out to, to my uh, MoTeC family on the call from New York, New Jersey. <laughs> Um, okay, the East Coast is in the house. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm relative, I still like to think of myself as relatively new as a field work coordinator, and I still have um, you know, challenges, of course. Uh, one particular challenge that's on my mind right now is, um, you know, I think one of my main jobs is really trying to match, right? Match the student with the site. And, um, I really want to draw the attention to the intersectionality between class and race. Um, where we're at in New York, I feel that, um, you know, we have sort of our premier institutions in the area and we want to try to um, make sure the student is ultimately successful. Uh, they have the clinical skills, but also the soft skills and the ability to I guess, navigate the dominant culture in these premier institutions. And uh, what I have trouble with is um, really, you know, obviously I, I, I had in, you know, certain internal, I've internalized many things, but really trying to understand and give uh, my student body, which I would, I, I would like to think is pretty representative of uh, both racially and uh, socioeconomically, at the university where I'm at, trying to give those students who may not be of a certain class, uh, may not have the certain um, interpersonal skills, uh, where uh, to sort of um, shine in these premier institutions. And, and then it's kind of turned around on the students where, um, you know, they don't necessarily have the social skills to go and ask a question or, or show, um, you know, kind of be vocal in a space where they may not feel comfortable. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm really, really just trying to um, ask if anyone ha has some pointers for me or some resources for me in terms of helping these students who are, you know, uh, of a, I guess, a lower socioeconomic status, maybe racialized, and still trying to navigate in these dominant uh, cultures. I have no answers, but I feel that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please share in the chat. Or go ahead, please. Oh, it's okay. Um, my name is Phyllis Simon. I'm also from our MoTeC group. I'm one of the field work coordinators at Columbia University. Um, you know, not just about this, but uh, but I hear what you're saying, and we all know this. There's a culture and a climate in every clinical site, right? And I, I always say, you know, you, I mean, I think what you said is, I think you started out. You have to have that right fit for a student to feel comfortable in, and they have to be they have to be knowledgeable and know what to be prepared for. Uh, and that's sometimes like, I, I hear what you're saying and I know working at one, I know the climate and the culture that's at the institution that I work at also. And they're tough pieces, but it, I, I think the students have to adapt also and look around them 
and learn from the experiences that you could still be yourself, but there may be places that you may not want to, I always look at it, not just in field work, but looking at as a professional. These are people you're going to be working with. These are people that you're an institution that may have different policies or, you know, practices that you may not be totally comfortable with. And I'm finding myself relying more on that. Like you're going to see things and hear things that you, or be, you know, exposed to things that you're not comfortable with. How are you going to deal with that as a professional? And, um, you know, it is our role to help um, educate. And that's where I'm sort of looking at what could we do? We had this discussion this week as a consortium of what are we going to do for our fieldwork educators to sort of help them deal with this situation. And that's, um, you know, because I, I don't know how much, you know, we can't, you know, for the immediate future, what can we change right now, right? We're all, it's little steps that are all going to be. And I, I think that's, what we're all trying to seek out. What can we do? The small things that hopefully will come together. So I don't have any answers. If you're going out either. Well, I think Phyllis, that's a great segue though. Because <laughs> it's like, what is one action item that we are planning to implement within the next four weeks? And I think we've talked about a lot of these challenges and you spoke to like, I don't, what, what can we do? And I think together as a group uh, can start talking about what are some things that we can do and, and really take that and, and, and move it towards action. We have a consortium also in California, which is helpful, but it doesn't solve all the problems, you know, because every program and, and institution has different uh, needs and maybe located in different areas of our communities. And uh, so it's, it's also very interesting in how, how are we going to take action, especially now uh, when we have to be even more so creative with uh, identifying fieldwork sites for students and uh, the barriers that may come with that. So anyone wants to start sharing or maybe want an action item or action that they would like to implement, or I'm going to kind of go on mute so everyone else can kind of share a little bit too. I, I can start if that's okay. Thank um, you, Karen. Hi, I'm also from Canada, actually here in Montreal. And uh, thank you so much. This has just been excellent um, discussion and panel. Um, so uh, within our program, we create, a, I would say as much as possible, we create a safe space and as yeah. much as possible, I, I, I try to really get that connection with the students. But the piece that I think we're missing is really naming um, the racism that can be, can be experienced um, on stage and kind of like, I really like the example that Corey used of having a narrative and and that's something that I think I'm going to incorporate in this seminar actually within the next month um, to really have a set out time of how we can discuss this openly which is I don't think has been talked about before and um, so hopefully students feel a bit more comfortable to I mean I think what I was listening to a lot in in terms of the different discussions is that I've had students come and see me when the big things happen, but I don't think they necessarily come when it's like microaggressions, small things that can cause, I think, a lot of harm. So anyways, I, I think that's what I'm going to be doing as an action item. That's excellent. Uh, and then having individuals lead that who may have had those lived experiences with microaggressions and, and can speak to that as well is also what I've been realizing is very important is that representation. Uh, that's excellent. That, that has happened often and I feel like students don't realize when it's also happening or don't know what to do or say because the power dynamics. So that's, that's really, really important. Anyone else like to share? Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you for the person taking notes in here. It says you're an, an anonymous octopus, but I just want to tell you, anonymous octopus, I appreciate you so much. Uh, all right, anyone else? Hi, this is Andrea. Um, Hi, Andrea. I don't have my camera on, so. No, thank you for joining I'm us. I'm totally in my bedroom chilling, so. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to share was uh, probably about 
maybe June or maybe even May um, of this past spring, we had a group of students that came together and approached some of us as faculty and, and I work in the fieldwork office, so they included me as well. And they wanted to address diversity in the curriculum. So they actually band together as a bunch of students and came up with a really phenomenally done presentation for all of the faculty, um, all of the fieldwork department. Um, so something I was actually thinking about doing with them is maybe talking to them about like what is some information we can pass along to their peers, but also maybe they can even help me create some kind of a education piece for our fieldwork educators because they have a lot of, like they had brilliant ideas of how to incorporate diversity into the curriculum. So I know that they will have brilliant ideas for how to get that information out to fieldwork educators as well. So I'm definitely gonna tap into them as a resource because they already want to happen and you know, they're, they're empowered to do that. So that's my plan. I love that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. You know, sometimes I feel like the students really uh, have a lot of the answers and solutions. And if we sit down and help them strategically think about uh, how to share that, we really can make some changes that are based on their needs. So thank you, Andrea, for sharing that. Uh, anybody else? How was everyone doing with being creative also during the pandemic and having to possibly do field works, you know, over telehealth and, and, and having these barriers and students who may be from marginalized backgrounds also dealing with a lot of other issues that with the social unrest and everything. How, how have you all been handling that challenge and taking action steps towards, towards making sure there's still meaningful experiences with field work during this time? I'm getting you a veggie. Yeah. Someone's ordering food. <laughs> I don't know who it is, but maybe you can meet yourself. See? It sounds delicious. Anyone else want to share? I see the chat. They just facilitated transition from our second year to first. For the new COTET chapter, we have had a few challenges of students comparing experiences more traditional to more innovative telehealth based. I've been noticing that a lot as well, that students are feeling a sense of grief, uh, especially having different experiences and have been sharing, you know, oftentimes the second year students keep talking about when they're in the classroom or when they went to field work and the second, the, the new students are feeling a sense of, um, of, of sad because they're feeling like they're being they're missing out on experiences that they should be having traditionally how have you all been dealing with that So I just wrote in the chat, but um, we've been having that issue uh, where I am I'm just uh, standing in for academic fieldwork coordinator, but there's just been a lot more compare and contrast, a little bit more unrest, a little more um, competition between one another instead of really coming back and having that conversation. So we've done a very academic thing, which I'm not sure is good or bad, but really brought things back to the accreditation standards. You're not getting gypped. These are the things you've already done. These are the things you're gonna do in the future. This is why we have implemented these measures in the short term. And here's other opportunities that we're trying to provide you to sort of round that out. Um, again, very much depends on the student's personality as to how receptive they are to that conversation. Um, but we have sort of brought it back because our students actually were concerned that we were not going to meet accreditation standards. Um, although we're very confident we are, it's just in the virtual context instead of the traditional experience that we're expecting.
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. And, and you're right. It always depends on how the student, you know, can personality and how they receive it and they feel confident that they'll receive the same experience and be prepared as an entry level practitioner. There's so many factors when having to communicate and, and work with students and sites. Uh, any other last final, we have one more, one, two more minutes uh, to really discuss final action steps that individuals may want to take or any questions that individuals may have before each other. We're a community of, of educators and, and field work uh, coordinators. So um, any last words or anything like that, uh, please do share. This is our time before we go back into the larger group. I just wanted to just add on, it has been interesting with the switch to telehealth because as we're getting the students who have finished and passed their NBCOT exams, a lot of times when we get their references, their future employers are asking if they have experience with telehealth. So that actually is definitely a win that they wouldn't have had as strongly before, um, before COVID happened. So I didn't want to come off all negative on that. It does. Well, there's always a silver sure. lining. Yes, <laughs> there's always a sure. silver lining, <laughs> which I, we were talking about this the other day, what I was talking with a few colleagues and we we're talking about how valuable the telehealth experience actually is and some of the skills that they're learning for the future and that, that this may be the future uh, as well. So I'm um, very happy that you shared this, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any last words, or is there anybody who wants to be our spoke spokesperson, first of all, for the group, we should get that decided upon right now. <laughs> uh, I will be more than happy anyone willing to kind of sum up some of the things that we talked about um, in our group. And, um, and if you will, just feel free to speak when we go back into the larger group. I want to thank you all so much for being here and for your energy. And we're gonna go back to the original Zoom link that we were in, sorry y'all. It's really hard to break it up, but we didn't want our coordinators and educators to be with students only and have a space just for ourselves. So Zoom really needs to change the feature a little bit, but until then, we're gonna go back to the original Zoom link and finish this off. I will post the link, oh my goodness, I will do that right now, no problem. If anyone has it faster than me, Go ahead and post it too. Uh, I'm happy you all like the discussion. I am posting the link right now for everyone. All right, there it is. Uh, Enjoy. We'll see you back over there. Uh, I won't hang up until you all may have it or copied and pasted it. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.